Good morning. Welcome to Anchor Church. I'm glad that you're here. If you're watching us online, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. It is, it is a privilege to be a part of what God is doing in your life, and it humbles me that this church and this congregation gets to be part of what the Lord is doing with you. And I can't stress that enough. When you join us online, I know I'm the face that you see. And I know you see the work of some of the guys on the tech team because we have one of those now, and it's exciting. You see the work of some of those other people. But I want you to know there's a congregation here at Anchor Church that we consider you part of what we do. You've been vital to what's going on. You have given, you have prayed, and you have given us an opportunity to, to minister and use the gifts God's given us. And we love you, and we're glad that you're part of what we're doing, even if it's on the other side of a screen. If you're ever able to be here in person, we would love to have you in the room with us. We would love to get to embrace you and encourage you and pray with you in person. We'd love for you to experience the atmosphere of what God does in this place before the camera ever gets turned on and before the video you watch is ever posted. But even if that never happens, we're glad that you're with us in the way that you are. Thank you for being here this morning. Those of you in the room, we've already experienced the presence of the Lord tremendously, and I don't believe he's done with us. In fact, he has a message for us on top of, on top of Randy speaking and on top of me rambling on and us talking about the presence and purpose of the Lord this morning before we even turned on the camera. The Lord has a message for us today. If you'll turn to Matthew chapter 6, we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 13 this morning. And if you give titles to your notes, this message is called Asking with Expectation. Asking with Expectation. Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. Depending on how well you know your Bible, that may sound familiar to you and forgive me if I look distracted I'm actually making sure I remembered to mute my phone so that it doesn't do the thing let me encourage you to do the same and I'm putting it face down so if anything comes through I don't even see it because I want to focus on the Lord this morning asking with expectation Matthew 6 verses 5 through 13 Let's just pray before we even read it. Father, I thank you this morning for the opportunity to be in your house and with your people. And I thank you for the great purpose that you have ordained for all of those who will, who will repent and believe and who will gather in your name. I look forward to how you plan to lead and guide and direct us in that this morning. I pray that I will speak well and speak clearly and speak with purpose what you have on your heart for your people. And I pray that your spirit, if it has not already, will prepare right now the hearts and the ears and the minds and the spirits of your people to receive what you have for them. As you're preparing us for the day and the week and the season and the purpose for the kingdom of God that lies ahead of us, I pray this morning that we would hear and receive from you that you would be glorified in all that we say and do, and we would leave here better equipped to do your work than we were when we arrived. We ask all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5, reads like this. Whenever you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. We could probably just start right there. <laughs> Stop right there and preach. When you pray, don't pray like hypocrites. What does that mean? We're going to find out. Whenever you pray, you must, be, must not be like the hypocrites because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. I assure you they've gotten their reward. But when you pray, go into your private room and shut your door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't babble like the idolaters since they imagine they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them. Because your Father knows the things that you need before you ask Him. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Many of you probably have memorized that prayer. And if you're like me, you probably memorized it in King James because that's the way you've heard it most of your life. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. 
slightly different wording. Sometimes it's good to look at it in a different way. This morning I read it from the Holman Christian Translation, which is what I read most of the time on Sunday mornings, though I read several others. But you're familiar, no matter what translation you've heard that from, you're familiar with this prayer. Perhaps not as familiar with the passage before it when Jesus is giving some instruction. Jesus is speaking and he's instructing those who believe in how they should approach him and how they should pray. How should we go to God the Father in our prayers? And this prayer has often been reduced to the nice, sweet little prayer that the little old ladies pray or that we say on special occasions like Thanksgiving and Easter and Christmas, and perhaps if we have a really moving worship service and we want to pray something together, we say that very sweetly and kindly at the end. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I don't mean to mock and make fun of that, but I believe we have sucked the power right out of this when we begin to pray it in that way because Jesus is speaking to those who are following him and he's giving some very bold instructions about how those who believe should approach God in heaven. And he says, when you pray, don't pray like hypocrites. Don't pray like people seeking for attention. Don't pray like people trying to say big, fancy, important words. Don't pray as if anyone other than your God matters. Pray as if he is the only one that matters and as if you actually expect him to be able to do something more than have people give you attention for what a good prayer that was, brother. We should have Brother Maynard pray this morning because, oh, his prayers are so moving and so eloquent. I mean, that's great, but if the Lord's not in it, I'm not interested. Don't pray like hypocrites and idolaters. What Jesus is telling us in this passage is that when you come into the presence of the Lord, you must ask and pray with expectation. When you come into the presence of the Lord, ask and pray with expectation. Prayer is the one place in our lives where we routinely ask for things hesitantly. We routinely ask passively and if, as if we don't expect to receive things. If I'm at work and I give someone a deadline and I show up on the morning it's due, I expect to get it because it is your job and your function and your position to give me this report, to have this area of the warehouse clean, to have this job function performed. There was an expectation placed upon the person. And we have no problem saying, why is this not done? How did you think that this was going to go if I showed up and asked for the thing you promised me and didn't have it? We look at our kids and we say, I expect you to have this done when I get home. My kids look at me and they say, what's for dinner? Why? Because they have an expectation that I'm going to feed them. Some of them every 15 minutes. How in the world are we going to pay for groceries when we have a 13-year-old boy in our house? I've told my wife several times, we're going to have to put a pantry in our bedroom closet and hide a mini fridge somewhere just so we get some of the good snacks at my house. My children have an expectation that I'm going to feed them. And my children... Hear me when I say this. My children are aware that they may not always get the thing that they want because my son, God bless him, he will have a steak for dinner every single night if you give him one. He gets that honest. I would too, yeah. <laughs> Occasionally, though, oh, I'm, the parents are going to come at me. None of you will, but the ones online, I, I can't wait. Occasionally, we will prepare a meal at our house that one of our children doesn't like what it is because my kids do not dictate the menu, but I make sure there's something that they can eat that's in the house. They may not like what I'm making for dinner, but I have provided something for them. And if they don't like that, I give them access to go get something else. You can make a peanut butter sandwich. We have tuna fish. There's mac and cheese. And you're old enough, you know how to work that out on the stove yourself. You know how the grill works. We got hot dogs. But what I made for your mom and I and everyone else that wants to eat it is this dinner that took an hour to cook. 
provided something for my kids and I've even provided something other than what I had in mind in case they aren't interested in what I provided for them there are still some other safe options in the house the point I make is this my kids come to me expecting my boss comes to me expecting I go to other people expecting but so often when I pray I'm like oh Lord if you will Oh, great creator of the universe who made everything and can do everything and told me he would do all the things. Uh, that's great and all, but, I mean, do you mind? Is it okay? I, I, you know what? Don't worry about it, God. I'll figure it out. Jesus says, don't pray like the hypocrites and the idolaters as if you believe he's not there to respond. Don't pray like those who would come to me as if I am not who I am and I'm not providing for you what I said I would. Jesus says, pray in this way, not hesitantly, not passively, not as if you expected to get nothing. The prayer of a disciple of Christ must be made with expectation. It has to. Because expectation is necessary not just to receive something, but it's commanded by Christ and it is modeled by Christ in the way he lived his life Jesus never once hesitated to go to his father that's the example this prayer says go to the Lord and ask and expect to receive something I tell you what I walk in the house and I tell my kids I've got something for you I suddenly have their attention And like yesterday, I walked into the house, and even though it was part of a candy bar that I tried a new flavor of something, and my son had said he wanted some, and I handed him that, and it was the tiniest little thing, pennies it cost to hand him part of a candy bar, but he was thrilled to death to get something from me. And that was just bait because I had actually bought him something bigger that he was excited about. Once I had him in the kitchen and I had his attention, but... I probably would have responded a little bit differently if I had said, I've got something for you. And my son was like, I don't believe it. If he had not come running up the stairs to say, oh, I'll be right there. Hang on. Give me a minute. Let me finish this game and then I'm coming. Which at our house is fine. I don't mind if you finish what you're working on. That's cool. If I need you not to, I'll tell you. But yeah, I'll be there. In just, but if you, no, I, I don't believe you. And then the same child had come to me hours later or the next day and said, Dad, I, I, I know you said you had something for me. And I mean, you probably forgot. And you probably don't care. And, and I'm pro you probably think I'm a terrible kid. And you, you probably gave it away to somebody else. It's probably not even for me anymore. And you may have even taken it back. But I, I was just thinking, maybe could you possibly, can I still? We pray like that. The Lord says, come to me with expectation. I've told you in thousands of words, I've told you what I have for you. Why would you come without the expectation to receive what I told you I had prepared? When we pray, we pray with expectation. And that's not just a suggestion. It's commanded when you pray, pray like this. That's an order. If we claim to be people of faith, we've got to act and speak as people of faith. Nowhere is that more important than when I am in the actual presence of God, which is what prayer is. Prayer we know to be communication with the Lord. We're talking to God himself, and when we pray, we're face to face with him in his presence. And God tells us exactly what to expect when we're in his presence. That phrase, when you pray... It means when you personally interact with, that means face-to-face, -face, personal interaction. Not through a phone, not over a distance, not with a text message, not the telephone game where I tell her and she tells her and she tells him and he tells them. Personal interaction when you pray. But there's another another. Other than the implication that it's personal, there's a definition in the way Jesus uses this word. He uses the word in a way that means this. When you exchange intentions with God the Father. Prayer is me exchanging my intentions with God's intentions. Lord, I have something in mind that is in accordance with your will. The Lord says, here's what I intended and what I have for you. 
We don't go to the Lord with a wish list. We're not coming with hopes. We're not coming with our hat in our hand. And we're not coming to negotiate. We're coming to say, Lord, replace my intentions with yours. Jesus says, pray like this. This is what prayer should be. The Lord's prayer is an example of what separates the prayers of disciples from the prayers of hypocrites and casual, ineffective Christians. Because casual, cultural, ineffective Christians come looking to God to satisfy their personal desires. Here's what I intend to get from you, Lord, provided. That is arrogance. That puts me at the center of this exchange. Hypocrites come seeking acknowledgement for their own spirituality. Oh, great God, I have done wonderful things for you, and now I am here to receive the dispensation according to the greatness of my work and my offering. Hypocrites, because they want to be acknowledged for how great they are and what they've done and think they're entitled to something because of their work. Paul had something to say about that. Rags. Scraps of cloth stained with menstrual blood. That's the best I've got, according to Paul. Hypocrites come seeking acknowledgement for their spirituality. The thing both of these groups have, idolaters, hypocrites, and then the casual cultural Christians that put themselves at the center of their faith, what they have in common, according to Christ, is that they did not show up with the proper expectation of God. They showed up expecting God to do for them based on them rather than to say lord what can i do for you what do you have for me to receive so that i may go and serve you with it this is important it's important that we understand prayer is about receiving god's intentions because god absolutely has intentions for you just as surely as i plan to feed my kids and clothe my kids and make sure that they are well cared for and make sure that they are disciplined and corrected so that they do not destroy their life with bad decisions just as surely as i provide for my children in this way god says i have some intentions for you none of you is a castaway or a has-been or a second thought You are the priority of God, and he says, I have intentions and plans for you. You are important and valuable to me, and I have something in mind just for you. If you'll show up and expect it. There are promises, and there is purpose, and there are plans that God has for you regarding how you will participate in his kingdom. And the prayer that Jesus gives us is a model of what has to happen in order for our participation to take place in the purpose of God. I want you to see this prayer differently this morning. There are three things in this prayer that must take place in order for us to participate in the intention of God. And all of them involve showing up with the right expectations. The first one is this. We have to recognize who God is. We've got to recognize who he is. Verse 9 says, our Father who is in heaven, your name is holy. This is who your God is. When we come before God, we have to recognize and acknowledge who it is we're talking to. This is not Joe Schmo off the street. This is not just some rich guy that might be able to solve my problems with his wallet. This is not some magician who simply wants to fix all of the things and entertain me and make me feel good about myself. My salvation is not a ticket to the big show with God. I gotta understand who he is. Our Father who is in heaven, recognize who God is. Understand that there is no greater power than the God to whom you pray. 1 Peter 5.11 says, All power belongs to God now and forever. There is not, there has been, and there will not be a greater power than the God that you speak to when you pray. Know who he is. There is also no higher authority than this God that you pray to. Matthew 28, 18 says, Jesus came near to them and says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Paul writes about this in Romans 13, 1. There is no authority except from God. And those authorities that exist do so because it is the will of God. There is no higher authority. There is no greater power. There's no one you're going to appeal to other than him. 
which is a beautiful picture because Jesus says when you pray, pray like this. Realize that there's not eight, nine, 10, 11, even one step between you and the most powerful person with all the authority that there is. It's God. You don't need me. You do not need your mother or your grandmother or the Pope or the president or the Supreme Court or Mary. You don't need anyone else to get you into the presence of the greatest power and greatest authority that there is. Jesus says, when you pray, know who you're praying to. I'm already at the top, and he's welcomed me in and wants to hear what I have to say. He's welcomed me in, and he's got plans for me. When we pray, we stand before a God that's got all the authority and all the power. And when we come to him without expectation, that's when we're praying like hypocrites and idolaters, like he said in verses 5 and 7. If I'm not expecting him to do what he says he can do, if I'm just there to say that I've ticked the box and I gave God a chance, I've not acknowledged who he is and I've messed this up. Come with some expectation. Know who you're talking to. In addition to realizing that there is no higher power and there is no greater authority, we also need to know there is no question of his ability or his intentions for you. I told you God has intentions. There is no question of his ability or what he intends. Mark chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. I'm going to paraphrase this. There's a man who has a son who is demon-possessed. And is having a fit in the middle of town. And lots of people have prayed for him and tried to cast the spirit out of him. And Jesus comes down off the mountain with a couple of disciples. And finds the other disciples and the priests and the Pharisees arguing. You've probably never seen a bunch of important Christians sit around and argue when there was a real problem that needed to be taken care of. Probably all the Christians you know rush straight to it. And they lay hands on and they pray and they want to be helpful. But poor Jesus, he had to deal with these people that just liked to argue amongst themselves and didn't want to actually do the work of the Lord. And they were concerned about what color the carpet was and whether it was the right day to pray and who was the best prayer and were we dressed appropriately to be able to help this poor boy or not. I know you don't know anybody like that, but that's, what, that's the garbage Jesus had to deal with. Jesus comes down and he sees this man and the man is in distress over what's happening with his son. And Jesus walks up and offers to help and in verse 22 and 23 of mark 9 the man looks at jesus and he says if you're able to help him will you and jesus responds to this man he says if i'm able i'm able to do everything for those that believe I can do all things for those who believe there is not a question of if It's a question of belief. Have I approached the God who can do it, understanding who he is with the confidence that his intention is to make good on what he said? That's the question. Not if he can. Have I approached him properly? See, our belief or our lack of it, I don't want you to walk away from this point with the idea that that somehow limits God, but my belief or lack of it does determine whether or not I get to receive and participate in what he's made available for me. If my son didn't believe I had brought him home a present yesterday, he wouldn't have it in his hands. He wouldn't be using it because he wouldn't have approached me to receive it. My belief determines whether I receive and get to participate because my belief determines how I approach the one who's providing we got to realize who it is we're talking to and what's at stake when we pray we got to do so with absolute confidence that he's able and we can't just be aware that he's able but we've got to begin to be aware of the scope of the possibilities when he invites us to come and speak to him we go to him focused on our tiny little thing And I don't mean to make a mockery of the things you would pray for. That's not what I'm saying. Do not hear what I'm not saying. But when I just go to him and say, will you heal this sickness and fix my body? When I go to him and I say, will you help me with this financial need? Will you take care of this person? Will you help me build this church? Will you help my children who are lost? When you're in those things, none of them feel small. But who am I talking to? I'm talking to the greatest power and the greatest authority, the one who is absolutely able to do all things, who has made his intentions abundantly clear to me. 
I can't go in with such a narrow focus and think this is the only thing he can do and it might be the only thing he ever will. There's a wide range of possibilities when God says, come to me because I'm able and I can do all things. If he invites you to come before him and speak, recognize who you're talking to. Don't be mistaken about who has given you his attention when he says pray. Come with an understanding of who he is and what he's capable of and have an expectation for him to do it on the scale of his ability. We stand before a God that can and who will do anything and everything the way that he promised with all of his power and all his authority. We need to learn to ask him accordingly. Ask him according to who he is and what he can do. Ask him according to his resources. Ask him in the way that my son comes and asks, can we have this for dinner? Because he knows that it's within my power and I will. Don't be afraid to ask. God has intentions for you and he has invited you to come and ask him for those promises he's made available. Ask him on the scale that he is capable Look at Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 3. He gets invited to ask God for anything he desires. The Lord says, Solomon, I'll give you whatever you want. You're a very young man and you're about to become king and you probably don't feel adequate for the job. I know God's never asked any of you to do anything you didn't quite feel up to, but Solomon had that experience. Let me just slide this in here for you. If God's asked you to do it, it absolutely will feel like it's bigger than you can do, and there's no way you can pull it off. If you look at the thing that you feel like God's asked you to do, and you think, oh, yeah, I can do that, probably not the full measure of what God's asking you to do. Might be a component of it, but it's not the whole picture. Solomon, you're young, And you're about to become king, and I will give you anything that you want, says the God of all creation. Solomon did not look at him and say, I sure would like a pony. Can I have a pony? I want it to be a pretty pony. I want it to be a healthy pony. And I want to be able to carry me all over the place so people will see what a great king I am on my new pony. How ridiculous would that prayer be in the scope of what this young man was about to face? I'm a young man about to be the king of God's chosen people. One of the greatest and wealthiest nations on the earth. I want a pony. Solomon understands who he's talking to. And Solomon absolutely, undoubtedly understands the assignment. He says, I'm talking to God, and I understand the scope of what God can provide. And so what he asks for is based on what he sees as available and what he sees as at stake in his asking. We don't often enough consider what is at stake when the Lord says, come to me and ask. Because we'll be focused on our tiny need or our tiny idea, and the Lord says, there's something bigger. Will you consider my kingdom? And when you ask accordingly, Solomon sees that and he sees, I need something broad and something lasting. And he says, give me wisdom. God, you know things that I can't know. There are things that only you know, and there are ways to apply that knowledge that only you know. Lord, give me that. I want to take that knowledge and I want to apply it for your glory. Lord, give me all that you have that I don't know and understand. And the Lord did not look at him and say, that's too big. Who do you think you are? You better downsize your britches, boy. No, the Lord looked at him. And it says God was pleased with this request. And granted it. Why did God do that? That request is the kind that God longs to fulfill and it pleases God specifically because it was asked according to who God is and what was at stake and what God was willing to provide. We have to understand who it is we're praying to. Who is your God? Our Father who art in heaven. The second thing we have to understand from this prayer is that we must pray according to God's will. Verse 10, Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this, your kingdom come, your will be done. Not, God, give me a nice house where people can come see me ride my little pony around the yard. 
your kingdom come and your will be done. God promises to provide anything we ask for as long as we do it according to his will and his purpose. Understand who he is, understand what he can provide, and then understand what he hopes to accomplish and pray accordingly. John 14, verses 12 through 14, read like this. Jesus is say, speaks and says, I assure you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. That's important. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it so people will see how great you are. I will do it so people see how awesome your church is. I will do it so that your life will be comfortable. No, that's not any of the things that he said. Ask it in my name and I will do it so that the Father may be glorified. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That phrase, ask in my name, it means ask according to my will. If you ask for something that falls within the parameters of my intention for the kingdom of God and humanity, it's yours. That I'll honor. God, give me wisdom that only you have so that I can bring glory to your people and your kingdom. Yes, I'm pleased, said the Lord to Solomon. And the same would be true with you. And I want you to hear this this morning. This doesn't mean there's some magic formula to getting what you want. It doesn't mean I pray the right words from God. It doesn't mean that I use prayer like it's a spell or some secret handshake that I've figured out that means the door will be opened and now I get all the things. There's not just one single thing in the will of God. I'm going to say that again because I want you to hear it. There is not one single thing in the will of God. We get the idea that if I say the right words and do the right thing and the lights are just right and I pray at the right time, then I'm going to open the door and God is going to show me the one thing I'm supposed to do, the one person I'm supposed to be with, the one function I'm supposed to perform. And if I miss that, there's no hope for me. If I miss that, there's nothing else for me. If I miss that, all hope is lost. I told you we have to understand the scope of the God to whom we pray and what is available to those who come to him. Jesus says, anything you ask in my name. That passage doesn't mean that we just slap Jesus' name on something and then God's obligated to do it. It means we need to understand the will of God and ask accordingly and realize his will is fairly broad. I know the path is narrow. I get that. We're talking to believers this morning. And within that narrow path, there is some width and some room. There is not just a single lane. This passage says if we understand the will of God, we can ask accordingly. And the way we begin to understand his will comes from that daily bread. We're going to address that in a minute. But that idea of spending time with God so that we know him and begin to understand his will, for us... And for the kingdom and for his people. What is God's will for something bigger than just me? This is not just about me praying, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. All of his kingdom. Not just me and my little corner of it. We learn that by spending time with the Lord. And when we spend some time with him, we find out the will of God encompasses a whole lot of territory. Ultimately, it's the declaration of the gospel and establishing his kingdom on the earth. We know that that's what he wants all of us to do. That's, that's the great commission. That's the thing that we're all obligated to if we say we follow him. But there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of ways to do that once we're aligned with him. And he makes every option to do so available and says if we'll ask according to his will, he will give it. And in the same way that my son would sometimes come to me and ask for something that I have the ability to give, I can say, certainly I could do that for you, but would you mind if I redirect your attention to something that might in the long run be better for you? Does that mean what he asked for is wrong? No. I'd love to give him a steak every night, but every once in a while he should probably eat a carrot or an apple. Every once in a while it's nice to have a great treat like cake. I know you would like to have the biggest, baddest, bestest thing. I know you would like to have the thing that looks greatest to you from this perspective, but my will has a range of options in it. And I'd like to correct you. Oh, that's an ugly word. Correction doesn't always mean the Lord looks at us and says, that's bad. You're a bad little sheep. 
Sometimes what the Lord says is, I realize this is what you would like, but can I point you towards something else that is also in my will, but will probably turn out better for you in the long run? <laughs> I get my way. I don't want you. <laughs> Leaving this church. Not your friend anymore. Not even sure I'm a Christian now. Correction doesn't mean you're bad. Sometimes it means I've got something that might be a little better for you. If you'll listen and let me lead you because my will and my purpose covers a large range of things. And if I serve a God that sees and understands things that are bigger than I can ask or think, he's got an option available for me that's better than I can think of. And perhaps I've brought him the best thought that I have. And he says, I want to exchange my intention for yours. Let me give you something better that you didn't even have the capacity to understand. You haven't considered this option. The will of God encompasses a lot of ter territory. There are a lot of opportunities and ways to accomplish what he has in mind once we're aligned with him. And this is where we get into, we, we're, we're referencing another word that we don't like. Let me, let me. Holiness. Holiness. What does that mean? It simply means I come before the Lord with my heart and my mind and my emotions and my spirit aligned with his and with the intention of making them so if they are not in the moment. It does not mean my tie is on just right and I didn't cause those men to lust by showing them my ankles. Holiness is something completely different. It's my posture before the Lord. This is a reference to holiness. We've got to come before the Lord with the intention of having everything about us aligned with him. And if we do that, then that's what will happen. That's weird. If I come to the Lord intending to have my intentions aligned with his, he will align my intentions with his? Yes. Otherwise, you'll be like that bolt that was stuck on the tire that you couldn't get off, that you started to beat and bang on and ended up rounded off, and then you broke the stem, and then you had to get a whole new wheel on the car because you were impatient and you were angry because all the Lord was trying to do was get you aligned with him, but you were resistant and refused, and now it's going to take a whole lot of work to fix what was a simple problem. But if we will come before him with the right intention, he will make right our intentions. <laughs> right? Prayer is literally the exchange of our intentions, trading mine for his. And once I'm aligned with Christ, I can be assured that what I ask is going to be in accordance with his will. If I am holy as he is holy, I'm going before the Lord and I'm saying, Lord, what do you have in mind? Here are the issues that face me. Here are the opportunities before me. Align my will and my spirit with yours. Little different than give me what I want. Because I've been good. And you promised the desires of my heart. Eh, I promised I'd make the desires in your heart like mine. I didn't promise I'd give you what you wanted. Completely different. We have to come to the Lord expecting for our intentions to be aligned with his. Oh. I came expecting him to give to me. You told me, ask according to how great he is and wonderful he is and how powerful and what authority he has. So if I come and I want steak for dinner, I should get steak for dinner. No, you should come saying, I want the best that you have available. And the Lord would say, my best is here. Let me align your intentions with mine. That doesn't mean that we're never going to come to him in the wrong spirit. I mean, once we understand who he is and what prayer does, we will start to realize that our laundry list is not the end result of what he intends to fulfill. But sometimes we come to him and we're a little out of alignment. And there are times when we pray out of our own understanding and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I don't want to discourage you from coming before the Lord with what you have to the best of your ability. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, it says, Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't worry, and when you get that way, bring everything you've got to the Lord. Let your request be made known. And the peace of God that surpasses every thought will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God will give you peace when you approach him with whatever your thoughts are. He will put you at ease before he begins to exchange your intentions, if you will let him. 
So bring him stuff. He will give you peace with his process and his will and his timing to address the things that you have concerns about. Sometimes you come before the Lord and say, this is the most pressing thing. And the Lord says, I understand that's important to you. Have peace. Know that I'm going to handle that. But that's not the most important thing in the kingdom right now. And it's not the most important thing in your life. You think it is. It's a distraction from the world. It's a distraction from the enemy. It's something that wants you to think it's the most important so you miss what I have here for you. Let me get your attention and let me align your intentions with mine. And be at peace that I'm going to handle this in my way, in my time. God will give you peace. He will even give you peace with the fact that what you've asked for isn't going to be resolved right this minute. What he guarantees us is if we pray according to his will, we will receive what he intends to give us. And peace is the first thing on the list. Peace that passes understanding. Peace in the midst of the storm. Peace when what I want isn't the same as what he wants. It's going to be okay. Trust me. We have to understand who we're praying to. Who is your God? We have to understand also his will and pray accordingly. And then finally, we have to ask, expecting to receive. You look at the next verses of this prayer, and Jesus says, If you, you who are saved and who know the Lord, who are disciples and following after him, when you pray, don't pray like hypocrites, don't pray like idolaters, pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And then he says to you, the believers who would come to him, he says, pray like this. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Those are statements. That is not, God, if you will, and if you can, and oh, I hope, and if you don't, it's okay. I'll figure something out and love you anyway. Please don't hit me with that lightning bolt. That's not the prayer. Give us, forgive us, deliver us. Statements. Because if I know who I'm praying to and I know what he's capable of, I have the right to come and ask him for the things he said he would do. And I have to expect him to do them. We've got to come boldly and expect to receive what God intends to give. We've got to come boldly and expect to receive what God promised us he had for us. Son, I have something for you. Okay, Dad, what do you got? Son, I'm going to the store and I'm going to come home with a new PlayStation controller. Awesome. I come in the door. Dad, did you get my PlayStation controller? Yes, I did. Why? Because I did what I said I would do. And you can count on me and you can depend on me. And I'm not mad at you for asking. Matthew 7, 9 through 11, Jesus tells a parable that outlines this, pic this picture. What man among you, if his son asks for bread, would give him a stone? Or if he asked for a fish, would you give him a snake? If you who are evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask of him? Good fathers don't leave their children hoping if he will provide for them or not. Good fathers don't leave their children fearful. Good children don't leave their children wondering, is dad actually willing to be here and do for me? Worse than that, good fathers don't leave their children in a position of hoping dad does not crush or poison or destroy me when he gets here. If even you, as human beings who are imperfect, know that that's not the way to treat your kids, how much more the God of heaven, your father, who happens to be the greatest, most powerful, greatest authority that there is who has good intentions for you and has communicated what they are, how much more so will he take care of you? Come to him expecting something. We don't come before a God who cannot or will not provide. We don't come before a God who is unwilling to make good on his promises. God makes clear to us what he can do and what he will do, and he makes clear what is available to you if you're gathered according to his purpose. Jesus says, ask God, your Father, for these things. When you pray, pray like this. The example of prayer gives, or the example of prayer that Jesus gives us, it is not a meek, quiet, mousy begging. It is a clear statement 
that we should come before God with confidence, knowing that we are his children, knowing who he is, knowing what his will for us is, and asking for it with the expectation that we will receive it because he's eager to give it. John 15 Verses 7 through 8 read like this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciples. God declares that those who serve him and ask according to his purpose will produce fruit. You put an apple seed in the ground, what happens? Grows an apple tree. What comes off the apple tree? Bananas. No, wrong. Apples, good fruit, exactly what you intended to get. If I come to God and I ask according to his purpose and he provides according to his intention, what will come out of me is exactly what he had in mind and it'll do exactly what it's supposed to do. What gets weird is when I try to take what God gave me and grow something different out of myself. What gets weird is when I go to God and ask him to do something other than his nature to make me something other than what he intended. That's when things get weird. God says, if you serve me and ask according to my purpose, you'll produce fruit. And I promise you this, God's purpose and plan for your life, it will require power, it will require require anointing, it will require authority, it will require discernment that you do not have. But what you must know is that he intends to give them to you and promises that he will. We've got to ask for these things with confident expectation that he's going to provide them. The same way kids chase the ice cream truck and don't have a problem asking for the ice cream when the guy finally stops. Here's my money. Give me that. Here you go. I know I'm old. I don't know the last time I saw an ice cream truck, but I remember being the kid that chased it. Even before I got this fat. We don't have a problem chasing down the ice cream truck because we know that he's going to provide me an ice cream. By the same token, we stand before a God who says, if you will show up prepared to ask for what I'm prepared to provide, I intend to give it to you. When the Lord sends his spirit and his presence, we have to stand expectantly in it. When the Lord sends a prophet or a teacher or a message from his word as we read or as we pray, then what we have to do is place a draw upon that thing and expect to get what God had in mind. We come with expectation before the Lord. When the Lord shows up, his intention is to give. And if you're in his presence, hear me this morning. I'm going to say the whole sentence again. When the Lord shows up, his intention is to give. And that intention includes you. If you are present when it happens, then the intention includes you. There is no one this morning in the presence of God who is not included in what God is doing and God is saying and God has called. I don't care if it's the first time you've heard it or the 5,000th time you've heard it. If you're hearing it, God says it's for you. I intend to do what I said I would do. When the Lord invites you to pray, ask him because the intention is there to give it to you. That includes you. Pray, that includes you. Ask me, that includes you. When he shows up, his intention includes you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. This is the last verse I'll share with you this morning. To him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. God includes you in his intention to do something bigger than you have asked, bigger than you have thought. Come and ask him and expect him to do it. He's made it so clear. Come boldly before the Lord and ask him with some expectation. Expect to meet with the God who is able and willing to do more than you can imagine this morning. Expect him to communicate with you and to communicate with great intention that he has intended since before the foundation of the world. Expect to receive everything that he has promised you for the sake of accomplishing the work of his kingdom. The Lord says this is how we should pray. Will you stand with me this morning? This is how we should pray, says the Lord. This morning, I'm going to put this on the screen so we can read it the same way and understand what it says. 
This morning, I want to pray this together, not as some sweet little church lady prayer, but as the disciples and followers of Christ who have gathered to accomplish his work and do his will. Will you pray this morning, not like the hypocrites and not like the idolaters, but will you pray with me with expectation placed upon the God of all creation who has intention and will for you? Seek him and ask with some expectation this morning. Say this with me. Our Father in heaven, your name is holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And that last word is so vitally important. The last thing I will share with you this morning, when we pray and we say amen, that is not just some nice little parting word like, see you later, y'all come back, now you hear. This is a word that means, let this be so. God, we recognize who you are. God, we want to pray according to your will. God, we expect you to do what you said. Let this be true in my life. Let's pray this morning. Father, I thank you today for caring enough to give us the instruction on how to pray, for showing us how to pray, for giving us such a bold outline, and Father, for being so clear in your intention for your people. Today, Father, by the power of your Spirit, adjust our intentions and let us place an expectation upon you for what you have promised to give and what you intend to do in our lives and in our community and in our church, all of it for the sake of your kingdom. Father, your will be done. Do as you've said. Make it so. Let it be true in the lives of your people today. Keep us safe as we go, Lord. Bring us back at the next time you'd have us gather. And remind us of what you've said in every moment between this one and that. So we can put it into practice for the sake of your glory in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. Bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Hope I'll get to see you again very soon.